Hello everybody, my name is the Gear to You, and today's episode of the 12 Days of Gaming, we'll be playing through... Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected. Now before we get started this time around, there's a, something that I'd like to explain real quick. Future Connected is an epilogue to the main game, so this is available right at the beginning of the game, but it will contain story spoilers of the main game if you play this one first, so I recommend only playing Future Connected if you already know what happens in the main story. With that being said, this video will not contain any story or spoilers whatsoever for either Future Connected or the main story, aside from a few things that I will be explaining, but nothing too big. So without further ado, let's get this started. Oh, so cute. <laughs> Alrighty then, so we're replaying it through a little bit of Xenoblade Chronicles Future Connected in today's episode of the 12 Days of Gaming. This is more so going to work similar to how the Xenoblade Chronicles 2 episode happened during the 2019 lineup, where we're not really going to be focusing on the story or anything like that, we're more so going to be discussing what the actual game is like and giving a bit of a tour of the overworld and things like that. So if you don't know what Xenoblade Chronicles is, first of all, shame on you. <laughs> Um, but uh, this is a, an action RPG with an emphasis on exploration. So these worlds are known for being absolutely massive, and Future Connected is no exception. Even though this is like a fairly short epilogue story, it still has a pretty decent uh, world to explore, and the world itself has some very interesting history behind it, which we'll be going into a little bit later. Now the combat system of Future Connected is a bit different than the regular game, because we don't really have access to the Monado or anything like that during this story. Instead, we have Nopon partners. We'll get more of these across the game as we complete more side quests and things like that, so that's your incentive to go out and explore the world. Thankfully, as far as I know, there's no padding or anything like that, like how they did Xenoblade Chronicles 2 Torna. Now, I do love Torn of the Golden Country. It is a fantastic game. It's just that at some point, it felt like it, they kind of padded it out a little bit. But thankfully, that's not the case with this game. So as we go across this area, there's a couple things I'd like to mention about the characters themselves. First of all, the only playable characters from the main game who return are Shulk and Melia, which I'm 100% okay with because everybody else already had a pretty good closer in their stories in the main story. Melia didn't though, and that's something that always rubbed me the wrong way about the main story. Now even though I absolutely love Xenoblade Chronicles, it is one of my favorite RPGs of all time. I feel like Amelia didn't really get that good of a closer in her story, and I think that's what Future Connected is really for. And of course we have Shulk here, because Shulk is the main character in the game, so he has to be here. But he doesn't feel forced in, so I really do appreciate the fact that Future Connected gives us Shulk and Melia a chance to really bond a bit more than they did during the main story. So we're going over here and fighting this uh, green ferris enemy and getting into Melia's combat. Her combat system works a little bit differently than how Shulk's does. Um, basically what you want to do is that for pretty much every party member you want to position yourself at just the right spot so that you can deal the best damage. For example, Shulk has an art called Backslash which does decent damage but is much more effective if you use it on the enemy's back. And it's one thing that I kind of struggle with sometimes whenever I play this game is that it can be a little bit hard to tell what's the front and what's the back of some of these enemies. Particularly the Mechon that we see in the base game. With Future Connected it's a little bit easier because most of the enemies that we see in this story are wildlife and things like that. So it's a little bit easier to tell in this one. Now Melia herself works a bit differently. Oh no, uh, we have a dead party member. Then now we are dead too. That's not very good at all. Um, okay, I'm gonna leave this battle because I'm too much of a chicken. Go, 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 run, you can do this, run, Melia, run for your life, and they're following me now, I don't want to give you an autograph. Oh uh, boy. Alright, it's been a little while since I've played Future Connected, and I've also never done this in commentary before, so... Yeah, I wasn't really paying attention to the battle that much, but basically what I was trying to say was that Melia works a little bit differently because she uses ether summons, so you have to 
summon an ether ability before you can actually attack. Melia is probably one of the more difficult characters to use in the game. So if you're going straight into Future Connected for whatever reason, you're probably better off playing with Shulk, because um, he's very easy to understand. But I've been playing Xenoblade it's pretty much since it first came out on Wii, so I've been fairly experienced with this game. Now, my mistake earlier was uh, going to a battle with a large group of enemies. You want to typically avoid that. You want to typically pick them off one by one. Um, because if you're dealing with a big group, especially when you don't have a whole lot of party members with you, then it can be pretty stressful. So after we defeat this bad guy, we'll be exploring a little bit more of the old world itself and discussing more of the development history behind it. First of all, just look at that sky. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> Oh man, Xenoblade Chronicles is definitely known for its beauty, and Future Connected is no exception. So before we go too much further, there is something that I'd like to explain real quick. So I'm going to be switching Melia's outfit real quick, uh, because first of all, I'm sorry Melia, I usually love you, but I don't really like their outfit from Future Connected. Same with Shulk, I think that's one aspect that's a little bit not that great about Future Connected, but... Melia does get some pretty new, pretty cool new outfits uh, in Future Connected, same with Shulka, it's just that I'm not a big fan of their base outfit. Uh, Melia, the one that I'm wearing right now, this one it takes a little bit of effort to unlock because you have to unlock a pretty big chunk of the Collectopedia in this world to be able to get this one. And the cool thing is when you unlock an outfit in this one, you can actually use it in the main game as well. So this is the one that I've been using in the main game because I love Melia and Melia is the Xenoblade waifu after all. <laughs> But anyway, oh no, get the rave from me, no. Yay, we escaped the evilness. I may be wondering what that blue dot is on the top of the screen. That's uh, um, kind of, that's the thing that points you in the right direction for continuing the story or whatever side quest you're currently involved in at the time. We are not going to be taking care of any of that in this video because I don't want to spoil any of the story elements in this game because Future Connected is indeed an epilogue and it would be very easy to spoil things, so I kind of don't want to do that right now. But what I will be doing is talking about the development history of Future Connected because it's very interesting. Now, the development history of Zoom Day Chronicles as a whole is very interesting and I already made a video on that subject. So on the corner of the screen, you will be taken to a gaming gallery we did on the collab channel that was narrated by Light Saga. So you can see more of the development history of Zimbabwe Chronicles in that video, but I'm more so specifically talking about the Bionis shoulder, particularly. So it was initially believed that when people first discovered this region in the Wii version of the game, it was originally believed that this was supposed to be kind of like a story location that would have taken place between um, Frontier Village and Earth Sea, because the transition between those two locations is kind of sudden, and uh, there are a lot of people, myself included, who theorized that this may have been a location that would have bridged the gap between those, but it was cut because they didn't want to pad out the game, and they also probably went over budget and ran out of development time and things like that, but that's actually not the case at all. The actual story behind it is that um, this was a test map that they made early in development. So they want to see just how big of a world that they could make with the Wii's memory limitations. And as we could see by exploring this area, they were probably surprised by how big they can actually make the world. So that's why you see a lot of early game assets in the Wii version of the Bionis Shoulder. You'll see a lot of towns that don't really fit in with the architecture of the rest of the world because this was a test world that they made to kind of test their ideas for stuff that they wanted to accomplish with the main game. And the reason why it's here is because the reason why it's here in the remake port, remaster, whatever you want to call this, is because they already had this on the disc of the Weavers, and they never removed it or anything like that, so they already had all the assets. And when they were making this game for Nintendo Switch, they wanted to do something with it. And because there were a lot of people who were asking for a better closer on Melia's story, they felt that they could kill two birds with one stone by making Melia's story part of the Bionis shoulder. And this is really interesting. I'd always love hearing development history and things like that. Now, I do kind of feel bad because... In the gaming gallery, that was the script for that was written before the interview happened where we found out about 
the actual story behind the development history. We have a pinned comment on that video explaining like the actual story behind it. But yeah, it's just always really interesting hearing things like that. Oh, that's a side quest thing. Okay, well now you have, now you've been spoiled by the fact that there are side quests in this game. <laughs> Now one thing that I really like about this game is that we can press up on the D-pad to have the character just automatically run and things like that. You would not believe how much of a lifesaver this is when playing in handheld mode. <laughs> because these worlds are absolutely massive and things like that, and it can take a little while to get across this area, especially when there's no run button or anything like that. So it's kind of nice when you're going across a massive area and there's not really much for you to do at the moment. You're not going to be facing a whole lot of enemies or anything like that. So it's kind of nice to just have the character automatically run while you go take a drink of water or check your phone or something like that. It's pretty nice. Now, you definitely don't want to do this too much because this isn't Breath of the Wild. You can't like automatically run the path. You will be running in a straight line and things like that. Now, you can adjust to where you're going if you move the thumbstick, but if you move down, for example, then it's automatically going to stop you and things like that, which isn't exactly the most pleasant thing in the world. But let's uh, run around for a little bit and just appreciate the beautiful sights of this world. What? Melia's hot. <laughs> okay, for uh, in all seriousness, yeah, let's just actually look at the prettiness of this world and things like that. We can technically play this game in first person mode, so those of you watching this video in VR, um, or however you'll be watching this, I'm pretty sure YouTube has a VR thing. For those of you watching this in VR, then yay, yeah, get to watch a, a super pretty 3D effect in this world and super pretty and stuff like that. So, yeah, we go across this area, and I gotta say, I really do love the detailing of the world and things like that. Like, I absolutely love how the original Xenoblade Chronicles looks in general. It's a very beautiful game, even on the Wii. But, man, they blew me out of the water when it came to this version. This game is just absolutely gorgeous. And it's still pretty great looking on when you're playing in handheld mode. That is one thing that I notice a lot of people kind of complain about is that th they, a lot of people seem to think that the Xenoblade games don't look that great in handheld mode. And I can kind of agree to that to a certain degree, um, because especially with Xenoblade Chronicles 2, the frame rate can kind of not be that great when you're playing in handheld mode. And there's also the fact that some of the textures kind of take a little bit longer to load. Honestly, I don't care. I think the art style still looks absolutely gorgeous in handheld mode, so it doesn't really bother me too much. I still love playing these games, and I would prefer playing them on a TV so I can really see the absolute beauty of these worlds the way they were meant to be played. But being able to play these games in handheld mode at all is just a really nice feature. Now as for how I'd want to do Xenoblade on the channel and things like that, it's kind of one of my life goals to let's play a Xenoblade game, um, because uh, I've been let's playing since 2012, so I do definitely feel confident in my abilities to do a 100% let's play of these games. But the thing is, these games are absolutely massive, so the amount of work that it would take to prepare a let's play of one of these games would take a lot of work. Like as it is, my let's play of Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, that took almost three years to plan out. Now that is a very massive game, but Xenoblade Chronicles is a whole different story. And there's also the fact that I don't really know which one I want to start with, because I always flip-flop between whether or not I want to do Xenoblade 1 or 2 first. Now, it doesn't really matter that much which one you play first, they're both really great introductory titles, and for the most part, each Xenoblade game can be the, a great experience the first one. The only exception that I would say would probably be Xenoblade Chronicles X. Now, the reason why I say that is because that's kind of like the Black Sheep in the series. It definitely does have a lot of the same elements of other Xenoblade games, but it's a very different experience. That one's more so focused on exploration rather than story, and I think the story is definitely the strongest uh, suit of the Xenoblade games. Now, exploration obviously is a major factor of what makes these games so great, but I think Xenoblade Chronicles X, the way that that game handles it, is just a little bit too different from how the other games do it. It's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just that if you want to get into the Xenoblade series, then you may want to play one of the other ones first, and then play it X. That, and also the fact that pretty much every other Xenoblade game is a lot more easily accessible nowadays. Um, because, like, oh, that was too far. <laughs> because 
At the time that I'm recording this video, Xenoblade X is currently the only Xenoblade game that can't be played on Nintendo Switch. It's only available on Wii U, which can be a little bit hard to come by nowadays. So, ooh, that waterfall is gorgeous. <laughs> I got distracted by a pretty waterfall. Where am I going? <laughs> I'm just kind of I'm just kind of running around aimlessly without really any direction of where I'm like where I want to go. Uh, I'm gonna go this way now. Uh, we explored that area a little bit, so let's go over this way now. So yeah, the thing with Xenoblade X is that, like I said, it's only available on the Wii U right now, so it's kind of a little tricky to find. Now, if it gets ported to Nintendo Switch, I'd be really happy because even though I do have my problems with that game, I would still love to be able to have the convenience of being able to play it in handheld mode and things like that. And also the idea of an open world planet being in a handheld game. That's the the idea of that is just really exciting. Pretty much every Zero Blade game is available on Nintendo Switch right now, so they're a lot easier to come by. Now, a part of me would say that Torn of the Golden Country would be a great way to be introduced to the series, but at the same time, it's kind of not. Um, because uh, the tricky thing about suggesting either that one or Zoomblade 2 first is that both games spoil the other one in some way. Because, uh, like, the thing with Torn of the Golden Country is that it was really made to be just a chapter of the main game, but they didn't have enough development time, so they made it DLC instead. So, it was made with the mindset that you're already at a certain point in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, but you're not any further than that point. So, it's a little bit weird. Now, I played Xenoblade 2 first, and then I played Torn of the Golden Country, but I know Penguin Garman played a Torn of first. So, either way, you can't go wrong, because both games are pretty incredible. Um, but, Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition would also be a great for starting point uh, for these games as well, because pretty much every game is a masterpiece. <laughs> I think I'm wandering around into a bad area. There's a lot of enemies with the red mark over their heads, which means that they're all super duper powerful, and that one can see us. Okie dokie, let's try to hide in this area. This is not a good idea. <laughs> I think I had to come in here to get some Clicktopedia points uh, to be able to get this outfit for Melia. So I have been here before, but there's a lot of tough enemies here. Okay, that in case and thing on the top of that arachno. Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's arachno. That one means that it can hear us. So, so if it's directly in front of us, then that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Because, like, it's not that big of a deal if they see us and things like that, if they're um, hearing based enemies. But if they hear us, then that's bad. And it's especially nasty when you're in a room like this where. You have enemies that are both hearing based and sight based. That's not very good at all. So the reason why you might, why you might want to go in there right now is because, like I said, I do believe that some of the Collectopedia items that you'd needed to get this outfit for Melia are located in there. So that's something that's pretty interesting indeed. And can we just take a look at this view over here? I mean, like, well, first of all, Melia is on screen, so the view is automatically going to be gorgeous, but. Like we can see the, we can see the town that we started with uh, way off in the distance over there. All of this is loaded at once, even on Wii. <laughs> this place is just absolutely massive. <laughs> one of my favorite things about Xenoblade Chronicles, not no, not necessarily for Xenoblade Two, but more so for the first one, is uh, going to a later location and seeing landmarks of an earlier place. I've made it a point during my Breath of the Wild Let's Play to do that, where, like, whenever we see a new tower, I'll usually point out uh, if we could see the Great Plateau or something like that, or another landmark that we may have seen earlier in the Let's Play. That's something that I would like to do with Xenoblade Chronicles if I ever make videos for this game as well. Now, like I said, I would absolutely love to make a Let's Play of Xenoblade Chronicles, but these games are absolutely massive and would take a long time to plan out, so don't expect a Xenoblade Let's Play anytime soon. Alright, so we're we'll be going over this way now. There's a cave over there that I'd like to explore. It's gonna be pretty fancy indeed. We can see Alchemoth right there in the distance, and there's a giant 
void right there that may or may not be important for the story or something like that. But like I said at the beginning of the video, we will not be just we will not be talking about story spoilers in this video. Even though if you start playing Future Connected right away, it will store it will spoil the story. So yay. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll be going over this way. Is this where I need to go for the story? Because, um, I, yeah, I think it is. Oh well. <laughs> we'll walk around this area for a little bit and try and do some stuff that are super cool and things like that. There's a lot of bad guys over there and... You know what? Why not? Uh, well, that's, uh, that's a pod. Okay, well, this is a great chance to demonstrate something else that's pretty nice about this game. So... The thing is, Gameplay Chronicles is this game can have some pretty mean difficulty spikes. So, there is a casual mode you can play, which will make combat a lot easier to deal with. Now, I try to avoid having that on whenever I'm playing through the game. Um, because, uh, like, I kind of don't want to make it too easy for me because I would like to have a decent challenge. But, I usually do have it on whenever I'm playing through a boss fight because I love Xenoblade Chronicles, but I don't want to be stuck on a boss fight for years. And I'm not exaggerating. There is a boss fight in Xenoblade Chronicles that I was literally stuck on for like two years. <laughs> uh, anybody who knows uh, anything about the late game of Xenoblade Chronicles probably knows which boss fight I'm talking about. Now, now there definitely were a lot of very really difficult bosses during Xenoblade Chronicles, but that one is just absolutely brutal. <laughs> Alright, so like I mentioned earlier, this is basically the primary gameplay gimmick of Melia, where we'll be able to use things like Summon Aqua to be able to discharge those elements and things like that. Now, I'm kind of just smashing the elements uh, because I'm not really paying attention to the combat and things like that, because I'm more so focusing on talking and things like that. So, the exact strategy may not be the best thing in the world. Alright, so we have a Union Strike right here, which at some point after we max out that bar thing up there, we will be able to use it. Um, not quite sure why it wasn't triggering right there, because the bar wasn't going up any higher or anything like that. But, we defeat the bad guys, so now we can claim our sweet, sweet wood, except we can't because we don't have that special tool. Okay, disclaimer. I haven't beaten Future Connected at the time that I'm recording this video, so I have no idea where that special tool is. <laughs> uh, is there anything down here that we can explore? Uh, this over here is making me think of a salvage point from Zoom Blade 2. <laughs> is there any point to this right here? Uh, the, point, the point of this is probably when you're looking outside, you can see this cliff and look, go inside the cave or something like that. And it's raining outside, as that's pretty fancy indeed. Alright, so I'm going to avoid most of these bad guys over here. We're just going to continue on our merry way through our path of glory. Get away from me. You're now allowed to hurt the Xenoblade waifu. We must protect the waifu at all costs. <laughs> when it comes to Xenoblade waifus, I'm on that line of thought. I was like, I can't, I can never decide whether or not I like uh, Melia or Pyramore. Um, because both of them are fantastic characters, and they're definitely some of my favorites from the games they came from. That looks really, really cool. Wow. Oh my goodness, that was awesome looking. <laughs> I'm going to save a video of that even though I'm recording this for YouTube. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, that, that, that was a really cool shot. I, I'm so happy this game has video recording, because... Zombie 2 and Torna don't have that. It makes me so sad that they never patched that in because there have been Switch games out there where they did patch in a video record thingy, so not sure why they couldn't do that for this, for the other two Xenoblades. But yeah, going back to my train of thought on favorite Xenoblade characters, like, Pyra is probably my favorite character in Zombie 2 as a whole, and when it comes to this one, I go back and forth between Melia and Shulk because they're both fantastic characters. But when it comes to waifus, I can never decide which one I like more, because Melia and Pyra are both just so awesome. <laughs> so I guess that's something for people in the comments to decide. Do you like Melia or Pyra more? I guess if, if I'm asking that question in this video, then people are probably going to be saying uh, Melia more, because we're playing Xenoblade right now. So far in every 12 Days of Gaming series, we always have a Xenoblade game on the channel during the lineup. So it's kind of interesting to think that next year will probably be the last one because 
Uh, next year's lineup will most likely have Torn of the Golden Country if uh, the trend continues of, of having a Xenoblade game every t every year. So beyond that, and, and, unless they make a new Xenoblade within the next year or two, we probably won't have one in the 2022 lineup. <laughs> if we do a 12 days of gaming during that year, because, um, well, I can't see the future, so I don't know if we will have a 12 days of gaming in 2022. I destroy you, and you're almost dead, except for now because you're halfway through, so I don't know what I was saying right there. We still can do a Union Strike. Okay, I, it's been a little while since I played this, so I don't entirely remember off the top of my head what exactly triggers that. I know that the blue bar on the top left um, is part of that because it is part of the chain tech, so I'm not trying to sure why it's not triggering right now. So as we continue across this area, and uh, we continue gushing over how awesome Melia is, now something really cool about her is that she is voiced by Jenna Coleman. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, then it's probably because uh, she plays an important role in a couple TV shows, like I think she's in like Doctor Who or something like that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head because... like. I've never watched Doctor Who, and I always feel bad whenever I say that because it's apparently like a really big, popular show and things like that. But Jenna Coleman is a pretty awesome voice actress, and her career really took off after she voiced Amelia in this game. And it's really cool because they were able to get her back for Xenoblade Definitive Edition. They are also able to get Adam Howden back for uh, Shulk as well. Now, he has been playing Shulk for a couple of years because he also voiced him during Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and Smash Bros. Ultimate and things like that. So, yeah, it's just really, really cool that they're able to get the voice actors back because it always kind of throws me off whenever they have, like, some kind of new story for a game and things like that, but they recast the actors. Um, like, I'm saying, like, way too much in this video. I apologize for that. <laughs> so, where is it going with this? Like, one big example that I could think of of games I've played recently is Spyro the Dragon, because they did bring back the voice actor for Spyro um, from Ripto's Rage and Year of the Dragon, but the voice actor that I'm more familiar with when it comes to Spyro the Dragon is the one from the very first game on PlayStation. Now, I know that... I keep falling off that same spot. I need to stop doing that. Now, I know that they recast the actor that does Spyro and things like that, so... It always throws me off whenever I hear the other actor who, funny enough, he actually does the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants. So oh, that's pretty amusing. Did I die? I died. Well, that sucks. Let's try that again. <laughs> Alright, jump up here and jump over this way. So, one thing worth mentioning is that after we're done with uh, this thing that we'll be doing next, we're going to be switching over to the main game for one particular spot. We won't be showcasing any story spoilers or anything like that, but there's one spot in Xenoblade Definitive Edition that I really want to demonstrate because it's just so pretty. That was tight, boss. So much strong. Set Set uh, move to manly salty tears. Now Set Set can go to Terrace in peace. Bear with Set Set one minute. Shouting out of blood, sweat, and tears, a determination conclude with success. You the boss, boss. I hope I was of some help. Sensei feels connected to you by unbreakable thread of destiny, boss. Gonna hang out with the crowd until we find Chief 1-1. One -one. Okay, okay. Quest complete. During journey to Bion's shoulder, Chief One Ones took Set Set aside and said, Set Set, Chief, have great trust in you. Set Set not so easily trusting as that, so not quite believed in Chief 100%. That way, Set Set got to see for Set Set's self what Chief One One get up to. This voice is hard to keep up with. Anyway, Set Set counting on your boss. Yay, we got a new friend. And I will be skipping over the rest of that. Yay! We got some more stuff and things. You can pause that on your own time if you want. 
So I think that's going to be a good place to call it quits for Future Connected. But like I said a moment ago, we will be playing a little bit of the main story now, just so that I can demonstrate some really cool things that I wasn't able to demonstrate when we first played as Blade Chronicles during the 12 days of gaming. The first part we'll be showcasing is Machno Falls, and oh my goodness, this is the perfect time for this! So we'll be going over this way as soon as I can find the bridge. And we'll be going over here, and... This is easily one of my favorite views in the entire game. And not just because Melly is on screen. I think I said this joke already in the video. But, yeah, we can see uh, the waterfalls off of the distance. You can actually go over there if you want a little bit later. Uh, most of the exploration is going to be done in the forest on both sides of this river over here. But you can see the waterfall over there. It's just so gorgeous. <laughs> I'm so happy this game is available on Switch now. <laughs> Not just because of the pretty HD prettiness and things like that, but also because, for once, this game is actually easy to find now. So, Xenoblade Chronicles has always had a bit of... Wow, uh, that's not a good spot. There you go. Xenoblade Chronicles has never really been a game that's been easy to find. Because when it first came out on Wii, it took forever to come out in North America. And when it did, it was only shipped to GameStop once as an exclusive. So it was really hard to find. So, not even joking, the second time that I saw it in stores, it was $90. And then a couple years later, they came out with the 3DS version of the game. But that was only available for the new 3DS. So not a whole lot of people really got a chance to play that one either. And that, and the fact that that version was also hard to come by too. And it was also available as a digital game on Wii U, but it was a Wii U digital game, so yeah, that one was also fairly difficult to find too. But now it's available on Nintendo Switch, it's available on the eShop on this, and we can all enjoy the awesomeness that's the Blade Chronicles. <laughs> and uh, with all that being said, we're gonna- uh, many keeps are running, there we go. Now that taking care of all of that, we're in this video- <laughs> Ricky! I uh, like how- <laughs> <laughs> like how his head was buried over the bridge really. But I mean, now we're taking care of all that, we're this video off here. So thank you all so much for watching this video of the 12 Days of Gaming. <laughs> Ricky side <of> enemies. <laughs> I love this game so much, I can't even do my outro. <laughs> So thank you all so much for watching this video of the 12 Days of Gaming. If you'd like to see a Let's Play of Xenoblade Chronicles, please let me know in the comments below. I would love to Let's Play one of these games someday. It's just that these games are absolutely massive and would take a long time to plan out. But it's something that I definitely would love to do someday. So thank you all so much for watching this video. And next time, Lady Gear to you. Oh yeah. Whee! Stupid bridge railing. <laughs> the way Amelia poked her head above the water is really cute. <laughs>